Step three, ion trap. In this step, we're going to talk about another quantum technology that can use as a quantum memory. So how do we use ions as quantum memories? Imagine that we've got an atom with positively charged nucleus over here, and then by knocking one of the electrons, we create a charged particle known as an ion. So ions are electrically charged, therefore they can be trapped with electromagnetic fields. Also, they have extremely good coherence times, in many cases in the excess of many dozens of seconds. The operations that we use to, to apply and manipulate ions are extremely high fidelity. And one interesting um, advantage is that these qubits are natural qubits, meaning that the nature provides them to us. We don't have to synthesize them, we don't have to manufacture them, meaning all of these qubits are by default identical and the same, which is always a very good property to have when you think about large scale. There are, however, some disadvantages that go along with these advantages. So the operations, they are high fidelity, but at the same time they are extremely slow when compared to other quantum technologies. And we require low temperatures and vacuum in order to achieve these high fidelities. And also the experimental setup gets quite complex with the size of the, of the ion trap because we will need a lot of uh, lasers. Why this is, we will see in this step as well. This is a basic schematic picture of an ion trap. Over here, these blue balls represent our ions, and they're sitting in a linear chain like this. These gray bits represent electrodes that produce electromagnetic fields, which trap the ions inside the trap, ensuring that they don't escape. The separation between the ions is of the order of uh, microns, about five microns or so. And also, because of these electromagnetic fields applied uh, by the electrodes, the ions are actually floating in mid-air, about 0.1 millimeters above the surface. So this uh, trap, there's nothing quantum about this trap. It's a, it's a classical machine, but it's highly complex with lots and lots of electrodes, which are very carefully controlled to ensure the stability or the position of the ions. What types of ions uh, uh, do we use? There's many different possibilities, such as calcium, ytterbium, or strontium. And in terms of the scale or the number of qubits that can be present in a trap, it can range anywhere from only few qubits all the way up to around 80 qubits, which is currently possible. How do we do population readout? The idea is very similar to what we saw in the previous step about NB centers in diamond. Over here, we've got our ground state manifold of the ion encoding our qubit. And the, uh, the up state over here and the down state over here. We apply a carefully tuned laser pulse given by this red arrow over here. If the population is in the up state, then it will be transferred into the excited state where the ion scatters light, meaning all the population that goes up here will de-excite producing photons, which we can then capture. On the other hand, if the population is in the ground state, then the transition frequency between the ground state and excited state is off resonant with the laser pulse applied, and therefore the population will not get transferred into excited state, and the ion will not scatter photons. The nice thing about this method of population readout is that we don't need a very careful measurements. Even if only 1% of the photon gets scattered, that's still enough to produce a very strong pulse and produce a nice uh, Z measurement in effect. And that's because these ions are very good light scatterers. They produce a lot of light when excited to the, um, to the excited state. How do we perform unitary gates? This is where we will see why we need a lot of lasers. For single qubit gates, this is quite straightforward. We need to choose an appropriately tuned laser and shine it at the atom on which we would wish to perform this unitary gate. For example, if you want to apply a unitary on ion 2, then we just shine this laser on ion 2 and we're done. If you want to apply a unitary on ion 4, we switch off the previous laser and shine a new laser at 
iron 4. How do we do multi-qubit measurements, uh, multi-qubit unitary gates? We have to use multiple lasers, and this is where the experimental complexity comes in. For example, we wish to apply a unitary on the qubits 2 and 3, for example, like a C0 gate. Then we require two lasers, which are one is shining at qubit uh, at ion 2, and the other one is shining at ion 3. Interesting thing is that these um, two qubit unitaries don't need to be applied in this way only to neighboring qubits. In particular, if you want to apply a unitary between ions 1, 2, and 4, so 4 is a non-neighboring uh, non-neighboring ion, all we have to do is we shine laser on ion 1, ion 2, and ion 4. And that applies the correct unitary. So despite the linear layout of the ions in the trap, the system has very high connectivity. How do we achieve ion photon entanglement? Remember, we are looking at ion traps as memories, which we would like to use for quantum networking. This is how it works. This, again, is our ground state manifold of down spin state and down spin uh, and up spin state. If we excite our ion into the excited state over here, it has two possible decay channels. One channel is to decay into the down state, producing a horizontally polarized photon. And the other channel is represented by this right path, decaying into the uh, up state, producing a vertically polarized photon. In other words, if we excite our ion and it de-excites, then we uh, create the following state between the ion and the flying qubit, the photon. We have a superposition where the ion is in the down state and the photon is in the horizontal polar polarization, plus the ion being in the up state and the photon having vertical polarization. But we have to ensure that we can actually capture this photon into the fiber. Typically what's done is we have to use a lens in order to increase the NA, the numerical aperture. For, uh, ions, they like, to, uh, they like to emit light in all possible directions. So we have to use a lens in order to catch the ion that's emitted within this cone and direct it back into the fiber. Once the photon is in the fiber, we can start talking about ion-ion entanglement over long distance. How do we do it? Again, the idea is uh, very similar as before, but we have to remember that now we're using polarization encoded flying qubits. Over here, we've got our node A. This is one of the ions in uh, one, lin uh, one ion trap at node A, and this is some other ion at node B. They emit photons, which are captured into the fiber, and then we perform a Bell state analysis. In other words, we perform a Bell state measurement. And this measurement setup is now given by this more complicated uh, Bell state measurement setup that we discussed in, in the first step because we are using uh, polarized photons. So the photon from node 8 comes here, photon from node B comes here, and depending on the pattern of clicks that we observe, our uh, Bell state measurement either succeeds or it fails because we can only distinguish two of the four Bell states. These are the basic ideas behind ion traps. See you in the next step.